Hi, greetings earthlings and others. Welcome to my little space in the corner of the YouTube world. Today, I would like to share a story with you. The story time with radio. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We can go to another world. Of course, we must discuss this copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowances made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comments, news, reporting, teaching, scholarships, education, research, fair use, etc., etc. We're not going to infringe. Just kidding, we have two disclaimers, just in case. Please note this channel features themes of violence, cursing, descriptions of sexual acts. It is not suitable for listeners under the age of 18. Some episodes may contain themes which may be triggering and feature content warning. Please take care of yourself and don't hesitate to ask for help if you need it. Well, let's get right into it. The book I want to share with you today is called The Gifts of Fear by Gavin D. Becca. I read this book probably back, uh, not to make myself sound so very old, but back in about 1997. I was young. I had kids. I worked at a bar at nighttime. I had to close up and walk home. And as a woman, I was taught to be polite, to not be rude. Like if somebody gives you a compliment, you're not supposed to be over here like, don't freaking look at me. You're supposed to be thankful. That's what we were taught to be thankful. If a man gives you a compliment or anybody gives you a compliment, we're supposed to be thankful. Even if it makes us uncomfortable, we were taught in my generation of women, we're pretty much taught to like laugh and just make jokes about being uncomfortable and things like that, which obviously didn't help us survive many of the things. Now this book definitely, look, I even studied this book is definitely filled with trigger warnings. These are real life stories written by an FBI agent who took his survival stories. And what he did was he breaks it down as to what exactly inside of them made them survive these horrific stories. Now, um, most of the names haven't even been changed. These are real case files. If you look hard enough, you could find them. So one of the things that stuck out to me were these little uh quotes that I kept from the book. Uh, believing that others will react as we would is the single most dangerous myth of intervention. And that's true. I've had that happen to me a couple of times because I'm like, certainly like, you know, just anything, anything at all. I'm a nice person instinctually. I tend to help people. If there's only one thing left. I don't really care. I'll let the other person have it. So not everybody's like that. Intuition is always right in at least two important ways. It is always in a response to something. It has always had your best interest at heart. That was another thing that I felt like uh, many times I've been very uncomfortable as a younger girl, as a woman now. I'm, I don't have any of these moments because I'm, I'm loud. I'm no, don't talk to me. No, thank you. But you get there. But not everybody has your best interest at heart. The first story is called In the Presence of Danger, and it is Kelly's story. I was originally going to try to put it all up there so you can read it, but I'm really new at this YouTube stuff. Oh, I'm just kidding. We have one more. True fear is a gift that signals us in the presence of danger. Thus, it will be based upon something you perceive in your environment or your circumstances. Unwarranted fear or worry will always be based upon something in your imagination or your memory. Yeah, there's been a couple of times in my life where I've been like, oh, I don't like the way this feels. feels like that last time something horrible happened. And when I listened, I ended up being safe and finding out that the other people that stayed behind had a, a quite hard experience. So I started to learn how to listen to my own instincts because you do know we're animals. Just because we're human doesn't mean we were not born with instincts. Trust what causes alarm. When it comes to danger, intuition is always right. And now we get into it. Here's the blank slide. We'll stay looking at this. Are you getting comfortable? Get comfortable. It's story time. Hopefully you enjoy the story as much as I did. Hopefully I put my glasses on. Story time. Let me put these glasses on. Chapter one, in the presence of danger. This above all, to refuse to be the victim. Margaret Atwood. 
He had probably been watching her for a while. We weren't sure, but what we do know is that she was not his first victim. This afternoon, in an effort to get all of her shopping done in one trip, Kelly had overestimated what she could comfortably carry home. Justifying her decision as she struggled with very heavy bags, she reminded herself that making two trips would have meant walking around after dark. And she was way too careful about her safety for that. See, at this point in time, she had to all, I guess, parameters that you could take your precautions by. She was. She was carrying twice as much so she wouldn't have to go back out after dark. She thought she was keeping herself safe. She closed the door behind her, pushing it until she heard it latch. She is certain she locked it, which means he must have already been inside the corridor. Oh, look at that. I already missed something. Up. It says that I forgot this part. Let's see. Walk around. She was too careful about her safety. She climbed the few steps to the apartment building door. She saw that it had been left unlatched again. Her neighbors just don't get it, she thought and thought their lack of security annoyed her. This time, she was glad and saved her the trouble of getting out her key. She closed the door behind her, pushing it until she heard it latch. She is certain she locked it, which means he must have already been inside the corridor. Next came the four flights of stairs, which she wanted to do in one trip. Near the top of the third landing, one of the bags gave way. Tearing open and dispensing cans of cat food, they rolled down the stairs almost playfully as if they were trying to get away from her. The can in the lead paused at the second floor landing, and Kelly watched as it literally turned the corner, gained some speed, and began seemingly mindfully hopping down the next flight of steps and out of sight. Oh, who hasn't had that happen, right? Got it! I'll bring it up, someone called out. Kelly didn't like the voice. Right from the start, something just sounded wrong to her, but then this friendly looking young guy came bounding up the steps, collecting cans along the way. He said, let me give you a hand. No, no, thanks, I've got it. You don't look like you've got it. What floor are you going to? She, she paused before answering him. The fourth, but I'm okay, really. He wouldn't hear a word of it. And by the point he had a collection of cans balanced between his chest and one arm. I'm going to the floor, fourth floor too, he said, and I'm late. Not my fault, broken watch. So let's not just stand here and give me that. He reached out and tugged on one of the heavier bags she was holding. She repeated, no, really, thanks. No, I've got it. Still holding on to the grocery bag, he said. There's such a thing as being too proud, you know. For a moment, Kelly didn't let go of that bag. And then she did. And this seemingly insignificant exchange between, between this cordial stranger and the recipient of his courtesy was a signal to him and to her that she was willing to trust him. As the bags passed from her control to his, so did she. We better hurry, he said, as he walked up those stairs ahead of her. We've got a hungry cat up there. Even though he seemed to want nothing more at the moment than to be helpful, she was apprehensive about him and for no good reason. She thought he was friendly and gentlemanly and she felt guilty about her suspicions. She didn't want to be the kind of person who just trusted everybody. So they were next approaching the door to her apartment. Did you know a cat could live for three weeks without eating, he said. I'll tell you how I learned that tidbit. I once forgot that I promised to feed my cat while a friend of mine was out of town. I promised to feed my friend's cat. Kelly was now standing at the door to her apartment, which she just opened. I'll take it from here, she said, hoping he'd hand her the groceries, except her thanks to be on his way. Instead, he said, oh, no, I didn't come this far to let you have another cat food spill. When she still hesitated to let him in her door, he laughed understandingly. Hey, we can leave the door open like ladies do in old movies. I'll just put the stuff down and I'll go, I promise. She did let him in but he did not keep his promise. There were so many times along in this scenario and how many of you have found yourself in a situation where you don't want to be rude. You cannot be rude. Ladies are not rude. At this point, as she is telling me the story of the rape and the whole three hour ordeal she suffered, Kelly pauses to weep quiet, quietly. She now knows that he killed one of his other victims. He stabbed her to death. All the while, 
Since soon after we sat down knee to knee in a small garden outside of my office, Kelly has been holding both my hands. She is 27 years old. Before the rape, she was a counselor for disturbed children, but she hasn't been back to work in a long while. That friendly looking young man had caused three hours of suffering in her apartment and at least three months of suffering in her memory. The confidence he scared off was still hiding. The dignity he pierced was still healing. Kelly is about to learn that listening to one small survival signal saved her life, just as failing to follow so many others had put her at risk in the first place. She looks at me through moist but clear eyes, says she wants to understand every strategy he used. She wants me to tell her what her intuition saw that saved her life, but she, but she will tell me. It was after he'd already held the gun to my head, after he raped me, it was after that he got up from the bed, got dressed and closed the window. He glanced at his watch and then started acting like he was in a hurry. I gotta be somewhere. Hey, don't look so scared. I promise I'm not gonna hurt you. Kelly absolutely knew he was lying. She knew he had planned to kill her. And although it may be hard to imagine, it was the first time since the incident began that she felt profound fear. He waved the gun and said, don't you move or do anything. I'm going to the kitchen to get something to drink and then I'll leave, I promise. But you stay right there, right where you are. He had little reason to be concerned that Kelly might disobey his instructions because she had been from the moment she let go of that bag until this moment completely under his control. You know I won't move, she assured him. But the instant he stepped from the room, Kelly stood up and walked after him, pulling the sheets off the bed with her. I was literally right behind him like a ghost, and he didn't know I was there. We walked down the hall together. At one point, he stopped, and so did I. He was looking at my stereo, which was playing some music, and he reached and made it louder. When he moved on to the kitchen, I turned and walked through the living room. Kelly could hear draws being opened as she walked out of her door, leaving it ajar. She walked directly into the apartment across the hall, which she somehow knew would be unlocked. Holding a finger up to single her surprised neighbor to be quiet, she locked the door behind her. I knew if I had stayed in my room, he was going to come back with the from the kitchen and kill me, but I don't know how I was so certain. Yes, you do, I tell her. She sighs and then goes over it again. He got up and got dressed, closed the window, looked at his watch. He promised he wouldn't hurt me, and that prom the promise came out of nowhere. Then he went into the kitchen to get a drink, supposedly, but I heard him opening drawers in there. He was looking for a knife, of course, but I knew way before that, she paused. I guess he wanted a knife because using the gun would be too noisy. What makes you think he was concerned about noise, I asked. I don't know. She takes a long pause, looks past me, back at the bedroom. Oh, I don't know. I get it, I get it. Noise was a thing, that's why he closed the window. That's how I knew. Since he was dressed and supposedly leaving, he had no other reason to close her window. It was a subtle signal that warned her, but it was fear that gave her the courage to get up without hesitation and fall close behind the man who intended to kill her. She later described a fear so complete that it replaced every feeling in her body like animal hiding inside of her. It opened to its full size and stood up using the muscles in her legs. I had nothing to do with it, she explained. I was a passenger moving down the hallway. What she experienced was real fear, not like when we're startled, not like the fear we feel in a movie or a fear of public speaking. This fear is a powerful ally that says, do what I tell you to do. Sometimes it tells a person to play dead or to stop breathing or to run or scream or fight. But to Kelly, it said, be quiet and don't doubt me and I'll get you out of here. Kelly told me she felt new confidence in herself knowing she had acted on the signal, knowing that saved her own life. She said she was tired of being blamed and blaming herself for letting him into her apartment. She said she had learned enough in our meeting to never again be victimized that way. Maybe that's the good to come from it, she reflected. The weird thing is, with all the information, I'm actually less afraid walking around now than I was before this happened. But there must be an easier way for people to learn. Whoops. The thought had occurred to me. I know that what saved Kelly's life can save yours in her courage, in her commitment to listen to intuition, and her determination to make some sense out of it. 
In her passion to be free, unwarranted fear, I saw that information could be shared, not just with victims, but with those who need to never become a victim at all. I want this book to help you be one of those people. Well, that was our first little ditty of story time with Radio Gods. I suggest every single person reads this book, Gift of Fear. It's not just for women, although statistically women are definitely victims of violent crimes way more than men. But hey, everybody can follow their instincts. Well, I kept it short and sweet. I'm going to go out there and be the change I want to see in the world. I hope you all do too. And until next time, just go be kind. <laughs>